hard-hitting questions coming out of yesterday. You know, I think one of them was uh, whether or not the horns down is going to be 15-yard penalty uh, in the SEC in the future. That it was very important to finish uh, and to collect the trophy and to win 10 games and win a game on New Year's Day and all those things. And uh, believe me, we had a great belief in our locker room. We didn't have to do anything special, just be us. I was so proud of this team. We had so much fun, it ought to be illegal. I said in my press conference back in December that I didn't feel like there was anything at South Carolina that we lacked to be a championship program, that we had everything that we needed. I am even more convinced of that now after being there for seven months. So there's a report in the Houston Chronicle that, that Texas and Oklahoma are inquiring about joining the SEC. <laughs> I bet they would. <laughs> War Eagle. It was good to say that. Uh, All right. <clears throat> I didn't even remember that 12 years ago, but now that you say that, because I believe there was something about someone didn't have Tebow first team All SEC. And as usual, I was accused of that. So <laughs> I brought my ballot to, to show everyone, to show Urban. Um, so. Hey, buddy, this beer's for you, Mike, and Cousin Shane. That SEC podcast loves the Pirate, and the Pirate loves that SEC podcast. Hail State. Ooh, welcome in to the latest episode of that SEC podcast. I'm your host, Michael Bratton. I go by SEC Mike on Twitter. And hey, got a great show lined up for you. Even though the news is slow, not a ton going on around the SEC, but I got a terrific guest on the show Got Jake Wimberly, great friend of the show, has been on the show a number of times. Going to break down some Mississippi State, some Ole Miss, and a little bit of teaser of his CFB hourglass projections. But we do have news and notes from A&M, Kentucky, Alabama before we get to that interview. So let's kick things off here, starting in College Station. News right before we broke in. You know, I think this is one that is going to make some headlines and people are going to raise their eyebrows and say, ooh, this could be a big loss for the Aggies, but I'm not particularly buying it. Former five-star recruit Damon Demas entering the transfer portal, leaving Texas A&M. And again, on the surface of it, you say, I've already seen Tennessee fans, Kentucky fans, Auburn writer saying, ooh, here we go. Here's a potential playmaker in the portal, but... I mean, in two seasons, Demas has got eight catches, excuse me, 15 catches in eight games, 135 yards and a touchdown. He's got massive potential, no doubt, very raw. But here's the kicker. I mean, A&M fans know this good and well. I don't even think they were anticipating him being a, any kind of factor this year as, uh, you know, he's got all kinds of allegations there of off the field, domestic assault, multiple occasions if I'm not mistaken he's been suspended from the team and more than anything I I think this reads as Jimbo saying you know we're washing our hands of this one and I don't think this is going to really affect A&M's plans on the field we'll see maybe he innocent till proven guilty here so hey he deserves his his day in court maybe he'll go off to a, a new school and prosper and there's a good chance that is in the SEC because those five stars given every opportunity to display their talent on the field. I hope uh, this situation resolves itself. But don't be fooled by the headlines. I don't think it's a big loss for A&M. And even if my school picked up Demas, at this point in time, I'm not sitting here. But it'd be unwise to think that he can really help your football team this season at least. That's my take on it. But next, let's kick it over down to Lexington where – Mm, Bit of bad news here for the Kentucky Wildcats defensive back Vito Tisdale out for the season. This is something that uh, Mark Stoops confirmed late last week. I forgot to hit on it on the last episode. But, uh, you know, this really hurts Kentucky's depth in the secondary, which was already an issue. Look for the Wildcats to be heavily, heavily involved in the transfer portal market for, I would think, multiple defensive backs. They need a corner. They need safety. They really need corner help, as does seemingly everybody in the country these days with the transfer portal. So Vito Tisdale lost for the season due to injury, suffered in camp. 
I believe he was uh, getting run at corner here when this injury occurred. So just something to monitor there. You know, it's not like Tisdale was one of their better players or anything, but he's got a lot of potential. So this could be a significant loss for the Kentucky Wildcats. Hate to hear this news, but that's not all that led off with the bad news. We got some potentially good news here because Will Levis spoke with the media last week as spring camp roaring here in Lexington. And, you know, Will Levis has got his detractors. And I've even, you know, I'm on record saying I I don't think he's a top two quarterback in the SEC East. Maybe he'll prove me wrong based on uh, his goals here this season. Completed 66% of his passes as the uh, starter there in Kentucky last season. That is excellent. He's trying to get that to the 70 per, 70% mark this season. Here's Will Levis on that and uh, how the new offense is coming together in their first camp in Lexington. So far. Is there anything in particular that you, coming into spring, that I want to get better in this area? That, just coming down off of shot plays, coming down, checking the ball down to the running back. I left a lot of incompletions on the table last year, even though, I mean, it was 68 percent completion last year could have very easily been 73 74 just with taking some of the stuff which is really good and um that's just one of those steps we need to do to get over that 70 percent threshold that, is that a technique thing? That it's a just a decision wise it's decision wise and, and just shot call doesn't mean shot taken and it's coming down and taking high percentage throws to the backs where two yard gains with one missed tackle can easily turn into 10 yard gains 70 percent threshold is that a goal for you this year 70 percent completion that's, that's the goal and um we were close last year but uh that's a it's it's a pretty good number to set yourself at as a quarterback. What do you like about this group so far this year? Just extremely yeah. well. What do you like about? I like the energy. I like the comp- comp- competition that's been going on, especially in the receiver room. There's been a lot of guys stepping up, knowing that with the opportunities there are at hand, um, going out there and eager to make plays, eager to be the guys on the field. Um, we had some some guys make one-on-one plays that we didn't really see a lot last year, just today, <laughs> which was great to see, and um, I just love the comp- competition and I love the energy for sure. So you gotta love. These comments, if you're a Kentucky fan, of course, you know, everything's on the up and up and everybody's undefeated this time of year. But if, you know, Chris Rodriguez, of course, he's going to be your workhorse once again, likely going to break the school rushing record. I mean, he's that caliber of a running back. But, you know, this is the new era of college football. I don't care how many yards Chris Rodriguez runs for. You're only going to go as far as Will Levis and his arm can take you in Lexington this season. And if Will Levis is completing 70% of his passes, cuts down on the interceptions, had 15, I believe. That's way too many for one season. If he can cut that to five, let's say, and and completes 70% of his passes or better, Kentucky's going to have themselves one hell of a year. And it's on Will Levis to get that done. And, you know, let's see. Let's see if he goes out there and proves me wrong. Maybe he is better than Spencer Rattler and Stetson Bennett and Hendon Hooker. I mean, we got some arms in the East now. So, Will Levis, we got to put him in the conversation for now. But for me, I got him a shade below those top-tier quarterbacks in the East. We'll see uh, what strides Will Levis takes year two in Kentucky. Now, last team we're going to hit on before we get to our interview here with Jake Wimberly. Let's kick it on down to Tuscaloosa, where we continue to harp on the fact that uh, Alabama picked up some really good players in the transfer portal. We heard it from the reigning Heisman Trophy winner Bryce Young last week on Jameer Gibbs, Jermaine Burton, what those guys bring to Alabama's offense, and even Saban, who... You know, he doesn't like to praise too many guys, particularly on the offensive side of the ball. We all know Nick Saban, defensive guru here. But, uh, you know, I could not be higher on Jameer Gibbs. And based on what Saban had to say, Burton's got all the tools that Alabama's looking for from an impact receiver, and they think he can make an impact right away, just like Jamison Williams did last season for the Crimson Tide. What do you like about Jameer Gibbs? Oh, he has really been – very good addition, you know, to our team. Uh, he's got great speed. Uh, he's really a good receiver, good third down back. He's got great vision. He's got really good burst out of a cut. Um, and, you know, I, I'm really, really impressed with what he's been able to do. He's smart. He's picked up things. He's an experienced player. So, uh, you know, he, he really 
uh, does a good job of uh, understanding what we're trying to do and how to do it, and that's what experienced players can do. So um, he's done a really, really good job. When you have players like Jamison Williams and Jermaine Burton who might have played different offenses elsewhere, how do you, what do you look for in kind of projecting that to Alabama's offense and, and maybe a bigger role they might play? Well, it, it's not really hard. I mean, it's easy to see, you know, wide receiver skill set. Um, and you know, Jermaine Burton has done a really good job. He's, he's been a real positive addition to the receiver core. Uh, he's got quickness, he's got speed, he's got really good hands, he runs good routes. And again, a little more experience, a little more maturity, uh, really you know, helps these guys learn and understand how to do things and understand the importance of doing little things right um, because they've played in games and they've played against good competition. So um, he, he has really done uh, an outstanding job in the three practices that uh, we've had so far. And last thing from uh, Tuscaloosa, I just thought this was hilarious, but I don't know what kind of technology they're using down there, but this seems to be a uh, annual issue here. The biggest problem they got in Tuscaloosa is uh, solving these mic issues. Here's uh, <laughs> Nick Saban getting frustrated with uh, not being able to hear these questions being posed to him. Just with Jameer Gibbs, what do you like about his game and what does he add to your offense? I, I don't know. Is the microphone on? or Jameer Gibbs. What do you like about Kind of bouncing off that freshman Kendrick Law, having him at wide receiver, what do you like about him at that position and kind of the skill set he brings to the team? Um, does that microphone actually work? I, okay, well, good. Well, I, I guess you're asking about Kendrick Law. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, he's done a nice <laughs> I just had to include that. I mean, that was just the damn funniest thing I saw here uh, in the SEC today. But, hey, enough of that. Let's kick it over to my good friend here, Jake Wimberly, host of the Afternoon Drive ESPN Radio in the state of Mississippi, talking Ole Miss, Mississippi State, some NIL. Let's kick it over to my buddy Jake. We're pleased to once again be joined by my man Jake Wimberly. You got to give him a follow on the Twitter machine, at Jake Wim. And, of course, you know by now he's the host of the Outstanding Afternoon Drive on ESPN 105.9 out of Jackson, Mississippi, and he's also the owner of CFBHourglass.com. Jake, thank you once again for joining the show. I really appreciate it. Michael, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Uh, I always appreciate you having me on. I love what you guys are doing, what you do over there. And hey, it's uh, it, college football never sleeps in the South, and that's you know we're we're blessed to be a part of all of that. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, you know, we're joking around. You know, we're we're kind of waiting for this tournament to come to an end so that uh, you know everybody locks back in with football. But it's wild, even with the NIL and all that coming down. You know, we've got reports of an eight million dollar quarterback and all that. What are you hearing behind the scenes with uh, State and Ole Miss when it comes to NIL? and how locked in the boosters are in doing everything they can. I've just not seen a ton of impact for those two schools in particular, but maybe you could shed a little bit of insight on that. Yeah, you know, the only thing, honestly, the football side of things is, is pretty quiet. You know, you, you hear rumblings of baseball and NIL money more so than football, which that would make sense at a place like Mississippi State. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, NIL money at Texas A&M and baseball. Um, you know, I think, I think Mississippi State and, and Ole Miss, for that, for that matter, Still trying to probably work through, and I'm sure that, the, you know, that this is just things that they don't talk about publicly. Trying to, you know, initiate those collectives, the collectives that are out there, uh, and I'm sure you've talked about it, you know, just the organizations that are tied to the, basically the athletic department to try to go ahead and, and find guys opportunities out there. But you're right, it's it's extremely, you know, kind of barren right now in Oxford and Starkville. And, you know, not, not as many opportunities per se as, you know, out in the state of Texas or in the state of Florida. Uh, but I would assume that those deals are going to populate. And, and look, it doesn't have to be necessarily inside the state of Mississippi. You, you know this. We're seeing these now, especially like Adidas, who just rolled out last week. That anybody that's in Adidas school, there's athletes will have an opportunity to make NIL money, depending on you know basically how how successful they are with their careers and their social media through social media campaigns. So you know, I would I would suspect you know by the time we hit the fall, you'll see a player or two, if not maybe even more. Uh, with some sort of an IL deal, and, and it very well could be social media driven, uh, but you never know. I mean, Will Rogers, he does have uh, some NIL stuff out there, some small stuff, and I would assume Jackson Dart is probably going to find something as well. 
Yeah, no doubt. Well, switching gears to uh, Mississippi State football, the Bulldogs just hit the practice field for the first time late last week. And, you know, before I get into any specifics on spring, you're as plugged in as anybody in that state on, on the Bulldogs and the fan base down there talking to the fans every day. Do you sense any, you know, loss of excitement? Because last season, you know, it's it certainly looked like Mississippi State had turned the corner under Mike Leach, and then you drop a disappointing egg bowl in Starkville, and then you turn around and you lay an egg in the in the bowl game against Texas Tech. Has that derailed any uh, hype heading into the offseason for the Bulldog fans? I don't think so. I mean, you get, you know, pockets of fans that are, that are not uh, overly excited about the football program. And, you know, I think for Mike Leach, I mean, believe it or not, I think one of the things that, that he kind of fights a little bit, and it's, it's not a massive fight, is coming off that baseball national championship last year. And, you know, the fan bases were so – their fan base was so dialed into that. And then, of course, you come out and you play a really close game against Louisiana Tech. You lose a game on the road against Memphis. You lose a close game against LSU. And I think at that point, people started to kind of check out. You heard a lot of grumblings about Will Rogers. You heard grumblings about not running the football. Um, you know, it's, it, you know, fans are interesting, Michael. You know that. We're, we're fans, too. But, you know, you get a place like Mississippi State, and it's like, hey, we want to throw the ball. We've never thrown the ball. Well, Dan Mullen comes in, and he, you know, puts in this power spread ten, over 10 years ago. They start throwing the ball. Now Mississippi State's got, you know, the, the guy that throws it. And then a lot of people say, hey, well, we, we're not running the ball. So, you, you know, it's, it's hard to keep everybody happy. But I, I think there was some excitement there with the victory at Auburn last year, the comeback, going on the road to beat Texas A&M. But I think it's the consistency that the fans want to see out of this football team. Um, I think a lot of people felt like Mike Leach was not necessarily dialed into the ball game. That kind of showed, at least by the players against Texas Tech, he was more involved in the, you know, the, the battle of words, shall we say, at the podium with Texas Tech. So I, I think, you know, yes, to answer your question in a long way, I think the, mo- the majority of the fans are excited about it. I think that they will be excited about it as we get closer to the season. And, you know, ticket sales look to be, you know, on the climb the way that, the, you know, on a traditional trajectory, which would mean that they're going to be high. So I, I think fans are excited about it. I just think, you know, there's cautious optimism with Mike Leach. Now, what are your thoughts on Mike Leach not being at uh, Mississippi State Pro Day? Is that just something that, us guys that just are hyper hyper focused on this SEC football, making too big of a deal of it, or or is this no no deal at all here? I I would tend to lean towards no deal at all. I mean, we know that Mike Leach is not your average guy. You know, that's been spoken about at nauseum. I mean, Mike Leach is a guy that you know he's going to show up and talk about hydration, or he may talk about uh, you know in, in an interview about a, a bottle of Coca Cola. You just never know where he's going to go. <laughs> Um, so, you know, for him not to, to necessarily be at the pro day, I, I wouldn't put a lot of stock into that. You know, there's a lot of times that these coaches and Mike Leach in particular, that they don't show up to practice a little later. So I just think that's Mike Leach. I think that is who he is. And, you know, you, you just gotta, gotta kind of take the whole, uh, gotta take the whole, whole package together that that is Mike Leach. You don't, you don't ever know where he's going to be or what he's going to be doing. Mm -hmm. Now you hit on the inconsistencies, but. You know, late last season, Mississippi State's offense under Will Rogers was just firing at uh, at a level we had we have not seen in Leach's short tenure down there in Starkville. Is it safe to predict that this is going to be the best offense yet for Mike Leach and company, considering Will Rogers is back, the running backs are back, weapons all around that offense with ton of experience in this system? Are you expecting this to be the best Mississippi State offense yet under Leach? Yeah, I think so. I mean, and you just go back and look at the projections of Mike Leach's offenses at Texas Tech and Washington State. And, you know, and look, Washington State, it was two totally different animals, so to speak. Uh, no pun intended. Texas Tech, he had a little talent there. He was able to get that thing moving by year three. Washington State, it took more like year five. But you, you saw a lot of – you go back and look at some of, the, some of the film, you look at some of the tape, you can go find that on YouTube and such. His offenses looked much more improved in year three than year one. And I think with Mississippi State, I mean, obviously, it's kind of a double-edged sword. He's playing with the most talented team that he's ever had as far as recruiting numbers and such is concerned. However, he's playing in the most talent-driven league in the country. So, But, yes, I do think with Rodgers coming in now year three, that these guys aren't going to be starstruck by going in any stadium. They've played a ton of SEC football. They've had a lot of snaps. Now you're putting another spring under them. Uh, you know, there's some transfer guys like everywhere else that's got to populate into these offenses and it really kind of get you know acclimated to what he's trying to do but I what I want to see is the consistency of the offense we know where Rodgers can throw it we know these guys can catch it 
is the consistency of the offense. Will checking into a little bit better plays in the run game because there are plays to be made in the run game in this offense, uh, especially when you're, you're talking about, you know, the wide splits, the, the offensive line play, the fact that you're, you know, running teams sideline to sideline, and typically only teams, teams only can have one guy in the box as, as, as a linebacker. There's check downs to be made. So I'm looking at the consistency level of this offense and, 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 you know, really kind of being able to play four quarters and to stack weekends on top of each other. But I do think this is going to be the best offense he's had yet. Now, what do you think about the defense? Because I think Zach Arnett, he may be the most underrated coordinator in the SEC. He, he keeps producing at a high level down there at Mississippi State, and he doesn't have the best talent to work with. Do you think he's got enough pieces to continue to do this? And, you know, they don't even need the defense to be – I'm not saying they need to be Georgia last year, but they just need to be competent. And with the offense they should have, it could make Mississippi State a really dangerous team. Yeah, I, I, of course, I really like Zach Arnett. I'm with you. I think he is very, uh, you know, I want to say undervalued. He's kind of overlooked around some really good defensive coordinators inside the Southeastern Conference. The, the biggest concern for Mississippi State right now is, is we've seen kind of a trend. They're starting to get a little thin along the defensive front. So, you know, there's some guys there, Nathan Pickering and some others. They've got some guys coming in from the junior college system, a couple transfers. They really are going to have to focus this year. Uh, it's not going to help them this fall, but 2023 recruiting-wise on that defensive line. You know, the transfer portal never sleeps like we talked about, so you may see them pick up a guy or two uh, post-spring. You know, it, it's a lot like NFL free agency. We saw the big move in, in, in the transfer portal, you know, post regular season all the way through recruiting and then now of course everybody's in spring we and i know you probably talked about this auburn already with the defensive back in the transfer portal you're going to see other guys hit the transfer portal after spring so they'll need to pick up maybe a guy or two for that defensive front but i think they do have the players if they can stay healthy to stay competitive defensively i mean look nobody's going to slow alabama down this year we know that uh tennessee if they don't play them they do not they, they're going to be tough to beat offensively but I, and Ole Miss should be good too. But I, I think Mississippi State has enough pieces on that defense, like you said, play a lot of bend but don't break and give your offense a chance and you win your football games and start with your offense this year. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of the transfer portal, naturally we got to go to the transfer portal king here, Lane Kiffin. Uh, the Rebels are just killing it in the transfer portal, remaking their roster in a span of an offseason. And we've just never seen anything like this because the, the portal is new. But, you know, I think Lane Kiffin has wisely looked at the SEC landscape and said, I'm not going to beat Alabama and A&M and LSU and Georgia for maybe some of these elite prospects I want. So what I am going to do is get extremely talented, experienced college players to plug and play. What are your thoughts on his strategy? And, and do you think he can keep that thing going to make uh, Ole Miss remain relevant or not, not relevant, but uh, an SEC West contender? You know, it's interesting you brought this question up. We were just talking about this today on, on the air, is that I will be interested to see in the next five to seven years if if there is a team that, you know, traditionally if we look at the numbers and recruiting and such, and, and everybody knows this, you know, your top teams in the college football playoff are going to be your, your, your guys that recruit the best, with the best coaches and the best quarterbacks. That's your Alabamas and Ohio States and, you know, Notre Dames and, you know, teams like that, Oklahoma, USC, if, if USC can get back up and running. If somebody can really use the transfer portal, play, you know, really smart money ball uh, type, you know, college football and bust this thing wide open through the transfer portal. Michigan State, look, they did, had a heck of a run last year under Mel Tucker. Um, you look at SMU and what Sonny Dykes was able to do when he got there. He used transfers, junior college players to do it. So I think Lane Kiffin, what he's doing is, is actually really smart. He's taken somewhat of an NFL general manager's approach to this and that, hey, we're going to use this quote-unquote free agency in college football, and we're going to build our roster. Now, you know, talking with uh, Chuck Oliver and some others, you know, today about this uh, on their shows, we were talking about Lane Kiffin as well. And, you know, I can remember back, you know, back in the 90s, Jackie Sherrill at Mississippi State used the junior college system very similarly. And Mississippi State's lone SEC Western Division title came off of the, the back of junior college players. Now, Kansas State did the same thing with Michael Bishop and some other uh, you know, really, really good talent out of the junior college, but the junior college system ended up biting Jackie Sherrill, amongst other things, in the early 2000s, which ultimately cost him his job. Now, we're, you know, fast forward 20, 25 years, uh, so much more in the evaluation process, the access to film, the access to scouting reports and such. 
I do like what Lane Kiffin's doing, but you have to be careful because if you get a bad apple or two, it could spoil the whole bunch. But I, I, I really like his approach, and I'm going to be interested to see how this – uh, how this works out in Oxford. Mm-hmm. Any early buzz on the quarterback Jackson Dart? Because let me tell you, Jake, I've, I've started my study of, of what he's done at uh, Southern Cal, and I know it was just one season, but you know he he's really wowed me with his talent. And I'm not saying he's going to be the greatest quarterback we've ever seen, but you know he seems like a natural to slide in there and replace Matt Corral in, in Lane Kiffin's offense. Yeah, I mean, the early nod is, and I did see you putting a, 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 some of that out, and I'm going to to go back and watch all of that, that you're doing on Jackson Dart. And, and you know, the initial uh, word on Dart is, I mean, he's the guy that kind of checks every box. Now, that doesn't mean that he'll be Matt Corral. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, and I think you and I spoke about this a couple weeks ago, is that the quarterback depth inside the Southeastern Conference this year is really deep. I mean, you go, you know, from Tennessee to Alabama, what's going on in Starkville, not Jackson Dart. What's, you know, what's going to be happening down at Texas A&M? Uh, can Jaden Daniels, you know, get up and running at LSU? So there's a lot of really good quarterback play. We're going to see some really good quarterback matchups this year in the league. But Jackson Dart, I think, gives Ole Miss as good an opportunity on a Saturday from the quarterback position uh, as anybody you could find, say, for instance, this year outside of Caleb Williams or, you know, Spencer Rattler at South Carolina. I think he gives you a, a really, really good chance to win, and we know this. Lane Kiffin's an amazing play caller. He knows how to put guys in position, and he will put Jackson Dart in the best chance, you know, best possible position to win. I always say, at least to me, one of the best jobs that Lane Kiffin ever did was with Blake Sims at Alabama. Mm-hmm. And you know, for him to be able to do that, and I know Alabama, everybody's going to go straight to well, Alabama's got more talent than anybody, but he really did a great job there, and I think he will do a wonderful job with Jackson Dart as well. Now, Ole Miss, of course, lost all three coordinators. Which one do you think is going to be the toughest to replace this year? Jeff Levy, DJ Durkin, or let's not even overlook special teams coordinator Coleman Hutzler, who is now at Alabama. Yeah, I, you know, we tend to take – you're right. We tend to take special teams off the board until it really bites you in the rear end. and Then it becomes mm-hmm. immensely important. Um, but if we're, if we're just kind of moving special teams to the side, it's going to be the defensive side. Ole Miss made a lot of strides defensively last year. They would get after the football. They were not always the best on the field, but they played with a lot of energy. They were always, for the most part, in right positions. I mean, they looked really good. Uh, you go back to that Texas A&M win last year. They looked really good in that ball game. They looked good against Mississippi State in the Egg Bowl. I mean, they just they played much better defense. So you don't want to see them go backwards defensively uh, because they may find themselves trying to get this offense up and running, especially in the first month. They're going to probably make some hiccups. So you want to be able to lean on your defense to play, you know, to kind of keep you in some of those ball games. So, you know, if I'm if I'm handicapping this, I'm going to go defense one, special teams two, and then offensive coordinator three because I think you know while Lane Kiffin, uh, you know, is replacing an offensive coordinator, that is still his offense. All right, Jake, let me get you out of here. I'm going to try to get you in trouble real quick, but Ole Miss hosting the Egg Bowl this year in Oxford, of course. Just based on what we know of the two teams right now, Mississippi State and Ole Miss. Which way do you lean is the favorite to win the Egg Bowl uh, this coming season? I would still have to lean Ole Miss. Uh, you know, if I'm if I'm blind handicapping this game for the sports gamers out there, Ole Miss minus three and a half, just because, mm. you know, it's in Oxford. And then, too, look, for whatever reason, Mike Leach has not done well in, in, in rivalry games, dating back to Washington State. I think he's lost seven, eight, and or nine straight rivalry games. I can't remember the exact number. It's somewhere in that in that neighborhood. And he desperately needs to win this Egg Bowl. I don't think that he's going to get fired if he loses it. But, you know, if Mississippi State uh, can win the Egg Bowl, I mean, they haven't won this thing since he's been there. So, you know, I would still give the, you know, give the edge to Ole Miss there being at home. Let's get a quick plug for you, Jake. CFBHourglass.com. When's your latest projections coming out? Can you share that with the audience? I cannot recommend the, pro- the projections you do more at CFBHourglass.com. Really appreciate that uh, and, and appreciate you uh, giving me a chance to plug that. Yeah, we're going to start rolling out things in two weeks. So, you know, Final Four ends this week. Monday, next Monday is the national championship. Let the dust settle, and then we'll be ready to roll with, uh, you know, power rankings that we'll roll out, which are not uh, – you know, I do it a couple different ways. One, the overall power rankings, and then, of course, work through the schedules and then the final final rankings as well uh, because, you know, obviously, as you know, everybody knows this. I mean, you, you could have a nice team populate in a power ranking, but – your schedule could be, you know, somewhat the death of you. So we'll be rolling out power rankings on teams, coaches, uh, updated coaching rankings all across 129 uh, Division One teams. That's group of five and power five, 
all SEC stuff, Big 12, Big 10, you name it, we're going to do it. And then, of course, uh, quarterback rankings, efficiency rankings, wide right, receiver rankings, and then, of course, we'll have records for all 129 teams. And then, of course, we'll move into the sports betting side of things where we'll handicap you know, a lot of games next year. And then, of course, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and pick a national champion uh, coming up. And I, I don't want to play spoiler here, but it's going to be hard to not pick, pick Alabama this year. <laughs> well, you just crushed my dreams. He's Jake Wimberly <laughs> at Jake Wim. Don't forget to check out his outstanding show, The Afternoon Drive, ESPN 105.9 out of Jackson, Mississippi, and CFB Hourglass. Dot com. Thank you so much, Jake. I really appreciate it. Hey, Mike, I appreciate you. We'll catch up. We'll do it again soon. I just want to say thanks again, Jake, for joining the show. Cannot thank you enough. And I'm going to have to have him back on when his CFB hourglass projections are released because he does a hell of a job there breaking down. Again, that when he's one of these analytics guys, so it's not his opinion. He's putting it into a computer. The model spits out the data and information, and I, I cannot wait. He's already given me a little bit of preview of uh, what it's going to look like. I can't reveal. Got to wait for him to actually put the CFB hourglass latest data out there. But I will have to have him back when that comes out. But cannot thank him enough. And, hey, that's going to do it. Shorter episode, like I said. Not a ton going around in the SEC. Tomorrow we got Shane Beamer, Jimbo Fisher, both meeting with the media. I got two other guests lined up for this week. So, hey, we're going to keep the content rolling this spring. Hope you guys appreciate it. We're a little under two weeks away from a bunch of spring games taking place here in the SEC. So stick with us. I really appreciate each and every one of you that uh, that says, sticks with us during the offseason because there ain't many places that's giving you SEC content five days a week. And uh, we appreciate we appreciate all the love we get from you guys. And spread the word. If you know you know someone out there looking for an SEC that's looking for SEC content in the offseason, you know where to send them, that SEC podcast. And we would appreciate each and every one of you that does that. But, hey, that's going to do it for the show. We'll catch you on the next one.